All right, good morning everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Patterson. I am the Archival Services Branch Manager here at KDLA and with me is Walter Bowman. He is our Archives Research Room Supervisor and we are going to get started. I wanted to apologize at first for the uh, upcoming events on the rotating slide. We put this together a while ago and forgot to update that screen. So <laughs> my apologies on that, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So uh, the State Archives collections here at KDLA are accessed primarily through two different places. We have our Archives Research Room, which is our public access point. That's where people can come in in person and um, view records themselves. Um, they also respond to requests that are coming through the mail, email, online, uh, telephone, things like that. Um, we have about 60,000, maybe more, rolls of microfilm. Most of it are county court records like wills and deeds and marriages and things like that. Um, also some agency records and other things. And they also provide access to the state publications collection through the Archives Research Room. The other area is the Archives Center. Um, they also respond to requests received through the mail, email, online, telephone. Um, it is a closed stack. It is not open to the public, but they do provide records for those walk-in patrons in the research room. And they do store about 125,000 cubic feet of original records and provide access to all of those. Um, a lot of those are circuit court records, but there's also a lot of state agency records there as well. Good morning. As Ms. Patterson said, I'm Walter Bowman. I'm the Research Room Supervisor here at KDLA. And what you're looking at is a picture of the Archives Research Room. Uh, the the, the 60,000 rolls of film that Jennifer mentioned are there visible in those cabinets, as well as, as the tables uh, where patrons come in and, and start their search by using the materials we have in the Research Room. Actually, on the right-hand side there, you can see one of a number of microfilm reader printers we have. Uh, the room you saw in the picture is the room where we provide public access to the records. Uh, it's a secure area. There's a guard station at the, front of, at the front of the building that you sign in. We limit the materials you can bring in. So, for instance, uh, probably just some writing implements uh, and some uh, notes because of the fact you're going to be using original records and any inadvertent use of those would be you know, harmful, obviously, and detrimental. Um, we have seven microfilm reader printers. Most of the collection as Jennifer said, the county records are on microfilm to the end that uh, microfilm is, too, as far as we know, has been in existence for 70 years, is a good medium that we can preserve these records on. And if for some reason we get to a point where there is no means of electronically accessing records, we can still use a magnifying glass and a flashlight to observe them, look at the records on microfilm. We do have multiple computer terminals uh, in the research room. We have uh, access to, uh, and a subscription to Ancestry Institution, uh, which kind of has the federal census and other records on there. It also helps some folks do their research and take their bearings in terms of getting started. And then we have a research room staff that has a very good knowledge of the records and hopefully can give you an idea of what records will best help you in terms of your genealog genealogical research. Um, so having said that, let me just kind of touch base on, on the microfilm itself. Microfilm was done initially in the late 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and, and forward in the 70s by the LDS Church. Uh, those records then were, as we go forward in time, the Kentucky Historical Society and then the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives fil filmed the records as well. So going back in time, county clerk records have been filmed in progression for over, probably over 50 years. And so that's why the collection keeps growing. As more county records are filmed by libraries and archives, then those records come to the research room, provide access for individuals to use. The advantage of having a collection of county records in the research room for multiple counties is that if you're doing research across several counties, you can look at marriages or deeds or tax lists or wills for multiple counties without driving courthouse to courthouse. So it's truly advantageous, obviously, if you're going to do courthouse research. Um, also, 
in terms of using the archives research room, the original uh, civil and criminal case files that Jennifer mentioned are housed in, in the uh, archive center in the same structure the research room is in, but are access to a secure, uh, to a lift and a, a room where the records are viewed individually. So that when you come in, if you're looking for that divorce case or that land dispute or that circuit record from many years ago, well, there's, indexing does exist, oftentimes done with the county, sometimes done by KDLA, and those records then, well, once you have the finding aid from the indexes, you will pull down the original cases, and you're able to view those cases in their entirety in the, ar in the uh, archives research room, which you see there. Uh, there's a series of tables there that what the records are brought down to, and you're able to view the records and photograph them, or, or in, and we can also make copies for you in, in some instances. So that, and these, these obviously cases can be very instructive. You can, obviously, a divorce will tell you a lot about what he thought of who, land disputes, you can get a very good look at land ownership um, in terms of who, who first owned the land, progressions forward. Sometimes you're really fortunate in these land dispute cases, you can actually see um, the um, neighbors around there as, as the plat, plat is laid off, or a plat map itself of land that you're looking for and, and trying to determine where an individual lived or the size of the plot and things of that nature. The records collection, of course, is not limited, as Jennifer was saying, to just the county clerk and circuit court clerk records. There are a number of other records that, that we house as well um, that have been microfilmed. And those, of course, can include things like military records, which um, there are a couple of collections of military records dating back to the 1790s, which our first campaign in, in, uh, in uh, Ohio with uh, uh, Anthony Wayne in 1794. The, again, the two records combined are very beneficial in terms of what you can do in terms of genealogy. So, for instance, the advantage of the tax list is you can find your ancestor on the tax list for the first time in a county, and then you can kind of move him forward either by deeds or the marriages and those other records. So it, it, it truly helps you establish a, a chain of, of uh, genealogy for your ancestor. I mean, we, we of course, hold tax list in very high esteem because the uh, they're probably more valuable to you than the uh, federal census. The sheriff is liable for the taxes when he collects them. If he does not collect them, then he has to come up with the money. So the, the sheriff is more motivated to find you than the census taker is. All right. Um, the other area that we've already discussed is our state archive center. And as you can see, it's sort of a big warehouse. Um, <clears throat> each of those boxes you can see is one cubic foot and as we said we have a, a, about 125,000 worth of that amount up there. Obviously there are books and other types of boxes but this is just our just one small section of it so you kind of get an idea of of how big it is and how how the records are stored. Um, this is definitely a, a secured area. Um, it's the entire third floor of our building. You need a key to get up there. It's also temperature and humidity controlled. Um, these records are permanent records. They must be kept, you know, in perpetuity as long as we exist, basically. Um, so they have to be kept, you know, as as controlled as possible. Um, we do also keep. Um, as we said, agency records and court cases, um, sometimes we still will send the original cases back to those agencies or the court that created the case if they request it, but obviously we prefer just to send copies out to people. Um, and as Walt mentioned, we do pull those original records um, for the patrons to view in that originals room downstairs in the archives research room. Um, so we'll kind of give you a general overview. Uh, Walt's already touched on some of this. Um, we have a, a wide variety of types of records here. Um, we do have vital records, births and deaths, and we'll get into those a little bit later with a little more distinction. Um, we do have the county court or the local records, as Walt mentioned, the deeds, wills, tax books, things like that. Um, we do have certain military collections, um, certain census collections and other things, um, circuit court cases, civil, criminal, divorces, court of appeals, Supreme Court, things like that. Um, we have Agency records that are considered permanent, um, only certain types are minutes, official correspondence, things like that. Um, and then we do have a very small set of historic newspapers um, that are 
available on microfilm, um, but we don't have a very good current collection. Um, we do have um, the Kentucky Gazette, which is a much older newspaper, and then we have certain years for the Courier Journal and Herald Leader and State Journal. So we'll, I'll turn it back over to Walt because he knows the vital records better than I do. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Kentucky did not have any kind of a vital statistics law prior to the year 1852. In conjunction with the cholera epidemic in the late 1840s, the um, physicians in the state asked that we begin to attempt tracking what people were dying of, and by virtue of that, we began tracking births also. The scenario was this. The law did not require the records to be recorded. So, for instance, they simply asked that if you had a death in your family or a birth in your family, you would go down to the county clerk's office and advise the county clerk that that had taken place. They then would compile a register at the end of each year that went to the auditor of public accounts. No agency was created to oversee vital statistics. So, that, and these, uh, and again, there was no compliance. So if you chose not to go, the, the, there was no you know, consideration for that. So that those records basically started in 1852. They lasted pretty comprehensively up until the time the, the war started. When the war started, Basically, all bets were off, and until from, so between 1862 and 1873, there were basically no births or deaths recorded in any county in the state. After, from 1873 and 1910, when the current vital statistics law was passed, the records do exist, but they exist with massive gaps. So, for instance, the decade of the 1880s, there are no births or deaths recorded uh, for any county in the state. These records have been scanned in their entirety into the Ancestry.com website on, on the Kentucky birth records or Kentucky Death Records link. In uh, 1910, we get our first vital statistics law. It actually covers basically November of 10 forward. The m many people who passed, or actually were born in November and December of 1910 would, would go in and go register the births later in the spring of 1911. But the law, the birth records are in essence held for 100 years and then released. We here at the archive do not yet have any 1911 births. The law probably can be interpreted as you have to be 100 years old or have passed away before the births can be released. So we, we have no way of knowing that there's not somewhere in the world some 107-year-old who's still out there who, who was born in Kentucky. So that, for that reason, all birth records are held by the Office of Vital Statistics. Indexing for those does exist on the Ancestry.com website. We'll provide you with a birth certificate number and just a Kentucky uh, birth index link on that website. Deaths, however, are held for 50 years and then released to, uh, to the archives. We, so we hold here at the archives death records in 1911 through 1965. Those same records are also scanned into the Ancestry.com website so that you can access those records either through us or, or through Ancestry. The, the scanned image of the death certificate are there. Post-1910 deaths, um, again, once the death, turns 50 year, death record turns 50 years old, they come to the archives. But if you're looking for someone who died, died after 1966, then or 67, the rolling date, obviously, from someone who's died more recent than 50 years, you have to contact the Office of Vital Statistics for that death certificate. However, the indexing for those records, for those death records, exists on the Ancestry.com website through 2000. So you can actually get a death certificate number for someone who's passed away up through the year 2000 on there. <clears throat> um to kind of do a wider and deeper version of what I was touching on earlier, we'll kind of look at some of the um, county records that are maintained on microfilm. The uh, probate files do not exist before the advent of the, the district court system, which came into existence as we see there in 1978. The county court dealt with those records prior to that, so that you would see the county court had a number of books, that, uh, record books that dealt with probate type information. Early on, a will book contained probably each probate type uh, type of record. So the three large probate records groups are the wills, the inventory and appraisement, and the settlement. So the will obviously speaks for itself. You have the will, you have the executor, and that's recorded in the will book. In the case of someone dying in test state, then you would have the uh, administration and the inventory and appraisement. For many years, those would go in the uh, will books also. But probably about the 1840s or so, 1840s or 50s, you will start to see separate inventory and appraisements and uh, state settlement books in various counties. So, so those three records groups are of great value, obviously. One, in terms of seeing the inventory, what the individual had when, when the estate is inventory, 
The other is you'll be occasion to see the administrator, which most times is named by, by the county, but at least you'll see who administered the estate, administrated the estate of the individual who passed away. Deeds kind of speak for themselves. Obviously, you can uh, look and see when your ancestor first purchased land in the county. Obviously, the deed is going to lay the property off for you. You can get your calls on there. You can, by means of whether or not the property hits a, a, road, a creek or a known road, you can get an idea of whether actually in the county the land lie. Deeds can also help prove uh, kinship. Uh, oftentimes, a young man, when he turned 21 to get his start in life, the father would deed to him a tract of land, which would you know, he'd be occasion to start farming and, and start, as I said, get started in life. But he would name the relationship, the father would name the relationship in the deed. So when he gave the young man the land, he would say, I deed to my son this tract of land. So you would you'd be able to identify the, the chain that way. Tax lists, as I mentioned, are probably very invaluable. They, they are a yearly census in the state. And as I mentioned earlier, the, ta the sheriff is far more motivated to find you than is the census taker. The sheriff is liable for the taxes if they're not collected. Our county taxes go back to 1787 with the Virginia County Tax List Law. Prior to that, we operated in the old Virginia Tithable Law. The tax lists uh, will name all males over 21. Even if they do not own land, the tax list is primarily created for militia purposes. Up until the 1850s, you paid your taxes at, at, the, at the militia muster. So there's a pretty good chance if you, you will see every male over 21 on that tax list. The tax list also will help you trace father to son. It's not a stated relationship, but when a young man turns 21, you will generally see him on the tax list owning nothing listed beside of his father. So the first time he shows up on the tax list, that's a good indication he has just turned 21 in the county. Marriages, uh, there are two types of marriage records that exist, in the, exist for that time period, the 18th and 19th century. One is the marriage bond, the other is the marriage register. The marriage bond, as you might imagine, it's all, all about the county getting their money, is a, a surety put up by the groom or someone who, speaking for the groom, that says you're going to do the right thing by the bride. You're not married somewhere else or there's not a, another consideration that's going to cause you to lose this $100 surety you have to put up. Generally, if it's a young man, you will see the father of the groom putting up the money for the surety. Uh, some, if the young man's older, you'll see himself putting up the money for the surety. So the marriage bond then will list the parties, the date of the marriage, the person putting up the bond. Uh, sometimes in these records, you will also see the father of the bride giving permission for the bride to marry. You will almost never see the mother of the bride or the mother of the groom in these instances, but you will certainly be occasion to see the father of the bride doing the marriage bond and then the father of the, of the uh, father of the groom doing the marriage bond and the father of the bride doing the permission. The second record is a register. The minister, when he conducts the ceremony, has to go in and let the county clerk know he conducted the ceremony. So a marriage register is usually a, a volume that contains a listing of, of uh, services conducted by an individual minister. This record would give you the date of the marriage, the parties, and the, and the minister who conducted the ceremony. So it depends on, you know, the bond obviously is more valuable in terms of determining the father of the, of the groom or the bride, and then the uh, actual register just kind of gives you a concrete date and gives you the, who conducted the ceremony. Uh, voter registration and election returns. Voter registration, obviously, is another way you'll see people come of age in the state. Uh, interestingly enough, we have voter registrations for the early 1920s, which, of course, is going to show you ladies registering to vote for the very first time. And, of course, you'll go down the, these lists of, of voter registrations, and you'll see all these ladies who not registered to vote the previous year. And, obviously, the reason for that is that they've just now achieved the right to vote, um, sadly. Election return records we hold in some part back into the 1790s. They are uh, sometimes they're just the sheriff certifying election returns, where he would sign off on the election and say that it conducted properly and show who the, the winning uh, person was the of the candidates person who won. Uh, later on, we actually have bound volumes of election returns that actually show breakdown by county in the state for national elections and and other. Um, for instance, uh, circuit judges and, and uh, other uh, general assembly and uh, national uh, congress elections are on there as well. So you can actually look and see how a county voted in a national election over the course of almost 200 years. Uh, other records we have that, that vary by county and by year, 
the every county has had at least one courthouse disaster. Some have had as many as four, and we lost 22 courthouses during the war. But um, these records, basically things like school census, which allows you to see how many children in a household at the time of the school census was taken, and records of that nature. There's are a wealth of smaller county clerk records in existence. Uh, the county court orders, for instance, are a tracking of the workings of county government. So, for instance, if you had an ancestor who worked on the road, the county would pay him money to, to uh, you know, maintain a section of the road, things of that nature. Uh, you will also see county officials named for the first time in that county court order book. Or you can actually see the first time a county is formed, you will see the, the county government attempt to raise money for the county structures. And you can also see whose house they met at when the county government is first, first formed in its county orders. So county records are, are a great wealth of information and value to individuals. And again, holding them here as a composite collection on microfilm saves a great deal of wear and tear on the genealogists and, and is very beneficial. Uh, military records, as I mentioned earlier, where records go back to the campaigns in the old Northwest, Anthony Wayne and, and uh, those campaigns, 1791, 1794, and they come forward from that point. We do have some must roll listings on microfilm of those formations that served in, in the old Northwest and at Tippecanoe. Then we come forward into the War of 1812. Uh, sadly, our War of 1812 records were lost to us in the 1880s. We had an adjutant general in the state who had to make room for the Civil War records, and he wasn't sure what, how to do that, so he burned the War of 1812 records. The only record that exists for our War of 1812 service is a bound volume with our muster roll listings. It reflects the individual entering the service, separating out of the service, and a note about his service, if, if it's a major event, a desertion or a wound or a death, would appear in those notes. There are a series of compiled service record cards held with the National Archives done for individuals in, in the uh, War of 1812, and, and those are obviously uh, accessed through contacting the National Archives. Sadly, the same is true of us for our service in the uh, Mexican War. Only a bound volume of the Adjutant General's muster roll listings survive, and to further pursue it, or, or to an individual, a research individual who served in the Mexican War, a uh, compiled service card would have to be obtained from the National Archives. The Civil War is a slightly different scenario. When, when the compiling, compiled service record simply means that sometime in the early 20th century, the National Archives set about on the Herculean task of creating a folder, basically, a service card folder for each individual service member in these conflicts. It is of losing descriptive lists and muster rolls. They showed when the individual had entered the service. Uh, the cards were done for a period of three months at a time. They show him entering the service. They show he's present or absent for those three months period. And they show when he separates out of the service. Uh, any uh, actual original documents that were included that the National Archives held in their possession were actually scanned, for instance, for taking the oath of allegiance for the Confederate side or a discharge for the Union side. Those are actually filmed and placed in these uh, compiled service records. So that having been said, those records had to be purchased from the National Archives. We hold a copy of them here for both the Union and Confederate armies, only for Kentucky formations. Any other, any you have to contact the state where the formation was from if you're looking for a unit besides a Kentucky unit. The um, compiled service records obviously are then ad, uh, supplemented by the Adjutant General's report. So just like the two Adjutant General's report for the War of 1812 and the Mexican War, the AG's report simply is a muster roll listing of individuals when they entered the service, when they separated out, any major event in the service. The, um, Southern, the Confederate service in the state, of which about 40,000 Kentuckians were in the Confederate service, the state paid a Confederate pension in 1912. They waited till the individuals were, you know, pretty advanced in age, and not every con surviving Confederate received a Confederate pension. Only about 6,000 of these were paid because they were actually in indigent or a widow's pension, so that you had to either be on hard financial times, only less than $200 in property or actual cash, or you had to be the widow of a passed away Confederate veteran. Spanish-American War, again, we do have a, uh, the muster roll listings for our service. There are four state regiments in the Spanish-American War. We also have the Adjutant General's report. that is more exhaustive for the Spanish-American War. We actually, these are individual synopsis uh, for each soldier showing 
when he entered the service, when he got out, a brief description of him and things of that nature. Uh, of course, we do have a, a, another collection, which I will come to in a minute, that will speak more to the individuals who served in the Spanish-American War. World War I draft registration cards we have, obviously, for each county. These were, of course, done starting in the spring of 1917, when the United States entered World War I and continue on for the next two years. And they are pretty valuable in terms of, even if you did not serve in the First World War, your occasion to see the individual uh, registering for service. It kind of describes him a little bit, gives his next of kin. So even, again, if your ancestor did not serve in, in the uh, First World War, the, the, you were liable to make the, do these, serve, these registration cards from age 17 into your mid-50s. So you've got a pretty good chance of getting a look at least of his appearance and next of kin on these. World War I service, car, World War I service cards, uh, when the World, First World War started, an agency created, organization I guess we'll call it, called the Council of Defense was tasked with tracking the service of each county and each state during the First World War, and one of the things this organization did was create service cards for individuals serving in the conflict. On these, you get a look at what formations he was in, when he went overseas, major events in the service, a casualty, a death or a wound, and when the individual returned to the state, you'll also, again, you know, get a little description of him as to where, where he entered the service and where he separated out. They can be also valuable in terms of family research. The Kentucky Veterans Bonus. Um, by good fortune, the state of Kentucky, between 1958 and 1962, floated a one-time veterans bonus, or floated a bond, and, and paid a one-time veterans bonus of up to $500 to individuals who had served between the Spanish-American War and the Korean War. These individuals, to prove their service, had to submit copies of their discharges. So that's where you'll see service discharges for individuals serving as far back as the Spanish-American War. One of the probably invaluable things about the Kentucky Veterans Bonus as that in 1973, the National Personnel Center, actually, the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis, Missouri, burned, and many, if not all, the World War II records were lost, as were a portion of the Korean War records. And in many instances, the discharges the individuals supplied for their Kentucky Veterans Bonus in 1958 through 62 are the only copies surviving of that individual's discharge. So we, we, we find ourselves very fortunate in that we do have that collection of discharge records covering World War II because that may be the only ones in existence. Uh, we also have uh, the enlistment records for the Kentucky Army National Guard for the time period of eight, and pretty prior to the State Guard and after 1912, the Kentucky Army National Guard for the years 1875 and 1940. And these enlistment records are kind of uh, are descript descriptive also. If you don't know, have a good idea what your ancestor's appearance was, then the enlistment record will kind of describe him height, weight, general appearance, eye color, things of that nature, when he entered the guard, when he separated out. Those can also be beneficial to you. The only frustration with those is, is as a general rule, for fewer than 5,000 folks a year, maybe as few as 2,000 a year, for many years would serve in those formations. So, but that, that look at military records, hopefully. Um, we did have a question about um, the World War One records. Are any of those online? The service, cards. the service cards or the draft registration cards? The draft registration, yes, should be on um, the uh, Ancestry has the draft registration cards on there. So they should be accessible. The service cards, to my knowledge, are not online. I don't think, uh, the, and the service cards are done by individual states. So the Council of Defense for each individual state has the service cards. So I don't think Fold 3 has, has gotten to having, well, the only, only site I could think of might have them, but I don't, I, to my knowledge, they do not have them. And I know that we have targeted that collection for future digitization. Not sure when, but that's on our list of things that we want to digitize and put out on our digital archive on our website. So the draft registration cards are there. The service cards aren't, but hopefully sometime in the near future they will be. Um, obviously, then we'll go into the, the census collection, the federal census we have uh, on microfilm up through, obviously, 1940. It's also, obviously, available on, um, on Ancestry. We lost our two first two federal census, uh, 1790, 1800, and uh, those were, of course, had to be reconstructed from tax lists. But starting in 1810, we were in pretty good shape to uh, have access to all the federal census, again, either in on microfilm or in um, 
on the ancestry. The federal mortality census, uh, interestingly enough, as you know, starting in the early 19th century, we begin to see special census um, appear in, conj in conjunction with the population census. One of those is a mortality census. This is first done in 1850. So what would happen is when the census taker visited a home, he would ask if anybody had passed away in the course of the last year. So when you look at the mortality census, you're looking at individuals who passed away between probably the summer of 1849 and the summer of 1850 for the first mortality census. And that's beneficial because obviously you we are now at least before the uh, the first vital stats laws passed in the state in 1852, and those will continue forward as you as you go. So 1860, 1870, 1880 all have mortality census. You can see individuals who passed away, for instance, in 1880 where no death records exist. You can see someone between the summer of 1879 and 1880 passing away. The veteran census of 1840 was primarily an attempt to look and see how many of our Revolutionary War veterans still survived, and very few of them did. As a matter of fact, Kentucky had a soldier's home predating the Confederate soldier's home and the Union soldier's home in the, in the early 20th and late 19th century for its Revolutionary War veterans, but by the mid-1840s, they were down to less, probably less than half a dozen veterans, and this was, the home was located at Harrodsburg, and the home closed. So the veteran census of 1840 is, again, looking to see how many generally uh, Revolutionary War and War of 1812 veterans survive. The 1860-1850 slave census is valuable if you have an idea who your, as a slave, who your ancestor was actually, who, who he was with during that time period. The census does not name individuals. It names the owner of the individuals and then describes the, the slave himself. So if you have a, a pretty good idea who your ancestor was, was with as a slave, you can look at that. And by, by turning by age primarily, obviously sex and age, um, if you think this person was somebody you have an interest in and follow that from there, it you know will show you up until the uh, folks born in 1852, because slaves do show up on those registers, those birth registers we talked about starting in 1852, so you can almost confirm the person born in 1852 as a slave on the 1860 slave census. The agricultural census uh, pretty much speaks for itself, 1850 to 1880. You can get a look at what uh, somebody is raising, what crops are being produced, livestock, things of that nature. So if you're looking at those deed records and you're not sure how your ancestor was doing in terms of what he was producing, the ag census will show you that you know, what, what was going on there. The manufacturing census, same scenario, is going to speak to what kind of industry is going on in various counties. You'll get an idea of what's being produced and then how many different kinds of shops and industries exist in a county. Okay. Okay. All right, so um, the next major set of records are the circuit and district court records. Um, these include civil and criminal case files for most counties um, from statehood or county creation up through 1977. There are about nine counties left, I think, that we do not have any circuit court records from, but we do have some or all from the rest of those counties. Um, for that time period up to 77, we do have indexes and order books for most records, but not for all. Um, the order books are a really nice resource, um, especially if the case files are missing, as long as the books survived, the, the general orders of the court were recorded there. You don't get all the details, but you'll at least usually find a judgment in a case and any other orders about, you know, commissioner's deeds and things like that, but, um, you know, you don't get the actual petition or the actual indictment detailing the incident uh, in question, but at least you find out the, the result. Um, we do also have some case files, including actual probate cases from 1978 up through about 1985 or 1986 for some counties. However, we do not have any indexes after 1978, so we um, always have to send people back to the circuit clerk's office to get their case number from the county. Um, but once they get us that case number, we can usually find the, the case file um, and uh, there's a couple links here on our website, and um, obviously if you download the PowerPoint, you can get right to those links, but um, we do send people to the counties. And then we do have a list on our website, um, on our ordering page, um, 
there's a, a link to a list of what years we have by record type and by county. So that's a good place to kind of start people at if they're asking, especially if they're asking you questions about how do I find this, you know, our, our ordering page has a lot of that information on it. Um, we also have connected with us a state record center. Um, they maintain the circuit and district court cases again at that 1978 time period when the court system changed up through the mid 2000s for some counties. Um, there are other counties that they don't have, they have fewer counties than we do, but they do have more modern cases. So um, again, they will need the case number provided by the court. Um, and then um, as you can see, their phone numbers are on there and um, they can pull those records there just as we do here. Um, Court of Appeals cases, obviously the um, Court of Appeals was the was the only appellate court up until 1977. Unfortunately, um, during the war, the court was burned and all the case files were lost. So our Court of Appeals collection starts in 1864. Um, we go up through the mid, uh, we have 2007 here, 2008, 2010 are at our record center. Um, when the Supreme Court was created in 1978, we do have their case files all the way up through 1910, and the Record Center has a few years beyond that as well. Um, another thing that people contact us for frequently are adoption records. We do have the adoption case files. However, they are restricted, so all we can do is refer people back to the county or to the Cabinet for Health and Family Services to submit a petition to inspect adoption records. Um, you know, we, we can't even look to see if there is one or not. We really can't do anything with adoptions except refer people back. Um, so that that's one of our main questions we get, but unfortunately we can't really help a whole lot with those. Um, the other state agency records we have varies greatly depending on the agency and the record type. Um, not all agencies have records here, and most records honestly that rec agencies create are not permanent as we mentioned you know minutes and official correspondence and certain record types are permanent and can come here but a lot are not um, we generally refer people back to the records officer for agency records um, and there's a link for that on our website as well um, ideally <laughs> when they accession the, the records with us they would list out you know what's actually in each box but most of the time it's really vague and so when people are trying to figure out like certain specific document it's very difficult for us to tell where to find that document based on the records that we have so oftentimes we'll send people back to that records officer because hopefully <laughs> they have a better idea of what's where they don't always but they're they're the agency that created those records so they're they know them much better than we do. We basically just store them. So that's our standard handling for, for agency records. Um, obviously there's our webpage that um, has already been shared a little bit. Um, so an another question, obviously, if you all are out and you're helping, you know, especially genealogy customers out throughout the state, um, easiest way is for people to come in and visit and look through records themselves but if they can't um, we do have a, a email address and a couple phone numbers here that um, you can call us for general questions we can't do the research over the phone unless it's a, a, a legal reason you know a lawyer needs something for a current court case or somebody needs their divorce or something for, for social security or the VA or something we can do that over the phone but normally we refer people to our website to do a request form. Um, there's online system that they can submit with a credit card or they can mail off one of the various PDF forms and mail it in with a request fee. Um, if, if they don't know if we have it, they can certainly call us and ask. Um, we can confirm that we have enough records to do a search, but we can't confirm that individual record over the phone or via the email. But we can at least tell you, yes, we should be able to search something submit the request. So, um, I'm going to actually go back a little bit because I know we had a specific question about um, criminal case files. Um, as we mentioned, we do have those for most counties. 
Um, for the time period, again, it, it varies by county, but um, there is that list on our website that gives specifically what years we do have. Um, everything is filed by the defendant's name. So um, if, if you don't know who was put on trial for something, I, we usually ask people to look through the newspapers around that time period to try to narrow down who it was. Um, sometimes if there's few enough people, especially if it's like a murder or something, which hopefully didn't happen all that often in that county around that time period, we may be able to try to look through the different murder indictments and see who the victim was, but it's, you know, it's it really, really need to know the name of the person who was put on trial. And also with those criminal cases, um, there's really not a whole lot to most of them. You get the indictment, maybe some subpoenas or bench warrants, um, maybe some other random orders or affidavits or something. Sometimes the jury instructions and then usually just a note from the jury, you know, not guilty or we find the defendant guilty and we, this is his sentence. Um, especially the older cases. The newer ones obviously have more in them, but it sounds bad, but in terms of criminal cases, if somebody's looking for something, it it's actually a good thing if they were convicted. <laughs> Because sometimes if they were convicted, they appealed. And if they went to the Court of Appeals, they would keep the actual trial transcript, like the, the testimony of all the parties, and they would keep a copy of that. And it's it, that would exist in the Court of Appeals case now. Otherwise, they threw them away, which, you know, sometimes we wish we could go back in time and tell people not to do things. But... Um, so, like I said, it sounds bad, but if, if somebody's looking for their relative who committed a crime, you almost hope that they were convicted and that they appealed because you're going to find a whole lot more information in that court of appeals case than you would in the actual uh, circuit court record. So, um, let's go back. So, again, um, are there any questions or did we miss anything Walt? I, I don't think so I mean obviously it's one of those things that that uh, once you start you know you, you will have more questions <laughs> I mean I can't really answer any questions specific I mean, you're sure welcome to ask it I mean, I look forward, and we look forward to y'all asking questions of us and we'll, we'll sort of try to give you an idea of where to start or what, rec what records are used for what but just as a general overview I think I think we spoke to what you know, <laughs> to the records and while you all are thinking of questions, too, we'll also throw out, um, if you go onto our website, there is um, a link there for both our catalog, which you can sort of find some of our archival collection in the catalog. It's not the best source for it, but you can sometimes find things that way. Um, the other thing that's on our website that's really neat is our Kentucky State Digital Archive. Um, Walter mentioned the Confederate pension records. Those are available online in that digital archive. Many of the governor's executive journals are on there. Um, and also a series of records that we collected from various sources, um, all relating to like the Hatfields and McCoys. Uh, I know those three particular collections are, are on there. As time goes on, um, we will obviously be putting more and more things in there. Um, we're actually doing a digitization project right now for the 1890 Constitutional Convention. Yes. Um, so that's going to be a neat collection once that gets finished. Um, so that that is an ever-changing place. Um, there's constantly new records coming in from agencies that are born digital. And also, as we're able to digitize records, here we, we put them in that so that's a good nice little source also and then Jennifer's talking just, just to uh, follow up on on she was discussing the Court of Appeals and one of the things that one of the cases that we were advantaged to have go to the Court of Appeals was the uh, Ellison Mounts and so for that time period as Jen said you would only see the criminal indictment in the final order so we would not have had the deposition well the supposed deposition of Ellis and Mounts in, in the uh, Hatfield McCoy feud in Eastern Kentucky, but by good fortune that case did go to the Court of Appeals, and we do have a confession uh, for Ellis and Mounts taken in 1890. So that's just an example of, of that. And those records are the ones that are actually scanned and on the, the digital archives. So. 
So do we have any other questions? Well, um, if there aren't any other questions right now, we will um, kind of wrap up here then. Sorry, this is my first time running the thing myself, so I'm hoping I got it all right. Um, there should be a link to a survey here that you all can please go to and uh, fill that out and let us know how we did and how we can make things better. And uh, as you can see here, thank you to IMLS for helping fund all our equipment and stuff to get this webinar up and running. And um, thank you all for attending. And if you have any other questions, our contact information is on those slides uh, for the, the main areas. And we look forward to helping you help your patrons. <laughs>